Welcome everybody to the third and last of our Age of Nature tiny screen lectures uh, here at Maine Public. I'm Robbie Feinberg. I'm a reporter for Maine Public. It, it's really been my pleasure to get to host the, these lectures over the past few weeks. Um, and and th this one is called Maine's Ocean, How Science is Powering Resilience for Coastal Ecosystems and Communities. Uh, now, before getting into it, we want to thank all of our partners and supporters who made this series possible. So we have the, the Nature Conservancy in Maine, the Maine Education Association, the Maine Mathematics and Science Alliance, and then, of course, our member support. It is truly, you know, all of, all of our supporters and members who help to make these kinds of programs possible here on Maine Public Radio and Maine Public Television. So thank you all so much. And just as, as some details, the Age of Nature, the, the documentary series that, that premiered on Wednesday, October 14th, so, so next Wednesday, on Maine Public Television, and it'll cover a lot of the same topics that, that we've discussed here today, also similar topics to our past talks as well. Uh, and we have details for that on our website. You can just go to, to mainepublic.org to learn more there. So I'm going to introduce our main lecture in a bit, but I'm very pleased that we have these experts who've taken the time to participate in our panel as well. Uh, we have Jeff Smith. He's the Director of Marine Programs at the Nature Conservancy in Maine. We have Rebecca Clark Uchenna. She's the STEM Education Specialist for the Maine Mathematics and Science Alliance and the Citizen Science in the Classroom Coordinator. We have Ben Martens. He's the Executive Director of the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association. And Gabby Hillier. She's the Co-Developer and Project Coordinator for the Maine Shellfish Learning Network. And so we're excited to hear from all of them in a bit. But before we go any further, I'd like to ask uh, Jeff Smith from the Nature Conservancy to read a land acknowledgement statement to uh, start us off. Thank you, Robbie, and good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> uh, we are here today to discuss the history, present, and future of Maine's oceans. And to do so, we must acknowledge the legacy and ongoing roles of the people of the Wabanaki Confederacy. From wherever in Maine most of us are tuning in today, we do so from the traditional territory of the Wabanaki people. The lands and waters of Maine have been their home for thousands of years, yet today they maintain the opportunity to steward less than 1% of their original homeland. Here, as in many places around the world, indigenous people have continually been denied the opportunity to participate in meaningful ways in the decisions that affect their traditional lands, waters, and livelihoods. Today and throughout these Age of Nature presentations and discussions, we recognize and pay respect to the Wabanaki people and acknowledge their deep and ongoing connection to the future of Maine's lands, waters, and communities. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jeff. Um, and now we'll move on to our featured speaker. Uh, Dr. Heather M. Leslie is the director of the Darling Marine Center at the University of Maine and an associate professor of marine sciences in New Maine School of Marine Sciences. An international leader in marine conservation science, uh, Heather conducts research on the ecology, policy, and management of coastal marine ecosystems. She studies the drivers of ecological and social processes in marine systems and how to more effectively connect science to policy and management. Uh, specific research areas include coastal marine ecology, human environmental linkages, particularly those related to coastal areas, and the design and evaluation of marine management strategies. A member of the University of Maine faculty since August 2015, Heather received an AB in biology from Harvard University, a PhD in zoology from Oregon State University, and she conducted postdoctoral research at Princeton University. She lives right by the Damariscotta River in Newcastle with her two children and her husband, who is microbial ecologist uh, Jeremy Rich. Her topic today is Maine's Ocean, How Science is Powering Resilience for Coastal Ecosystems and Communities. Welcome, Heather. Thank you very much. Thank you to Maine Public for hosting the series and all the partners and to Robbie for hosting. All right, Robbie, can you see the right screen? I can. Yes, it's looking great. You're sounding great. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, so again, thank you all for joining this afternoon. It's, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be uh, wrapping up this series. And I'm really excited to read your questions and hear the discussants comments and additions to uh, what I have to share in the next 20 minutes or so. So the goal of my 20 minute presentation is to um, lay the groundwork for a conversation about how science is contributing to resilience for coastal ecosystems and communities here in Maine specifically. And it will start with a little bit of doom and gloom, I'll warn you, but I hope that you leave this presentation with uh, a recognition of how much hope and activity there is in our state in particular around ensuring a thriving future, both for nature and for people. And this, this photo on the first page here is a great example of, of how these pieces are coming together. This is one of our students from the University of Maine who is conducting uh, research right off the coast from the Darling Center here in the Damariscotta River. And she's gathering information on plankton. And they're, they can be esoteric, but they're also the foundation of marine food webs. So what we learn about plankton, the tiny critters living in the water, is super important to understand how our environment is changing and what that means for fish populations and fisheries dependent communities. And, and we have over 80 uh, fisheries dependent communities here in Maine. So um, basic science like this uh, provides a foundational piece of knowledge to help steward those communities into the future. All right, let's see, I need to figure out my arrows here. Um, as, I, as I mentioned up front, we're at a challenging time uh, for, for Maine's coastal communities. We're facing rapid change both economically and uh, environmentally. And climate change is the focus of my remarks today, uh, but that's not to uh, minimize other changes facing us, nor uh, the role the, of the pandemic, uh, which has exacerbated many of the difficulties uh, that particularly remote and rural communities face on our coast. Maine's climate is changing. And I can see that when I walk out my back door, this is the mud flat that's just uh, a little bit away from my house on the Damariscotta River estuary. And on this mud flat, we're seeing the results of uh, climate changes that have been documented here in Maine and around the world. We're also seeing that sea level is rising. This is another view of the upper Damariscotta River estuary just around the corner from this landing. Uh, there's a parking lot, the Damariscotta parking lot, which has been at the forefront. Uh, the community of Damariscotta has been at the forefront of addressing climate change impacts like sea level rise. And the reason for that is that on king tides, there's often water creeping up into the parking lot or even up through the storm drains more than once a year uh, in, in recent memory. And because of rising sea levels and then the storms that also uh, are becoming more frequent, this is a real issue for the whole downtown area. That's just one example of, of really immediate implications of sea level rise. So ocean chemistry is also changing. And this larval lobster is an example of that, that changing ocean chemistry. Uh, this larval lobster and many other organisms require uh, calcium carbonate to form their shells. And uh, this is one of the newer elements of sea of, of climate change impacts that uh, we're facing from a scientific perspective. We really only started measuring ocean acidification or the decrease in pH in the ocean uh, in the last 20 or so years, at least in this part of the world regularly. And so uh, this is something that's being tracked very closely in the scientific community here in Maine and elsewhere, because if the ocean pH changes dramatically enough, it's going to be hard for organisms like this to form their, form their shells. And finally, the value and the diversity of Maine fisheries have changed dramatically in the last 50 years. Uh, and this figure uh, from the Maine Department of Marine Resources illustrates that. I just want you to focus on two colors, not everything that's going on here. If you look at the bottom, that's uh, years from 1950 through 2015. And then in metric tons, you are seeing uh, the change in fisheries landings from the mid part of last century till, till nearly current day. And you can see on the right, the dominance of lobster 
and also the decrease in landings that are uh, contributed by other species. So we're really now in a very lobster dominated state, whereas 50 or 60 years ago, it was much, a much more diverse set of species, many different colors there on the left-hand side of this slide, uh, representing many different species and groups of species that were caught by Maine fishermen. So the consequences of this uh, are important, not just for the environment and understanding what's going on under the surface of the ocean, but it also matters in terms of what products are available for fishermen and fishing communities to distribute here in Maine and in other parts of the world. And there's consequences uh, also in terms of uh, local economies and um, social networks. So just to drive this point home a little bit farther, uh, how people fish, not just what people fish, has also changed through time. Here's a picture from, or a, a wood print from 1892 that depicts uh, how cod were caught, hand lined off Grand Banks uh, and areas closer to our coast here in Maine. And while the technology has certainly evolved a lot in the 100 years plus since this image was made, uh, you can see from this picture how closely linked people are to the ocean has not changed, that we still depend on the ocean for sustenance and for employment and for adventure. Uh, and these interlinkages between people and ocean environments are really something that I think sets us apart as a state. Uh, our coastal communities and our ecosystems are foundational to our identity as well as to our economy. And for that reason, coastal and marine issues were ones that were called out uh, in the Maine Climate Council formation last year in a, in a particular way. And I had the good fortune to lead the working group that provided information and suggested strategies to the Maine Climate Council in this area of, of the coastal and marine domain. So I want to talk a, just a little bit about uh, some of the science that informs the work that we've done here in Maine on climate change responses. And then I'll briefly introduce the range of strategies that our working group uh, brought to the council. And then we'll, we'll have a chance to have discussion about it. So a lot of the, the science um, that is being done in support of managing these climate impacts is in the area of um, what's called ecosystem-based science and management. And this is a science and management approach that recognizes the connections that I just went through, the connections between people and nature, between fishermen and fisheries, uh, between coastal economies, and uh, the estuaries that, that are right alongside them. It is a place-based science. It demands information at a finer scale than we've often had in the past. And it encompasses these many different activities and values that people have for ocean ecosystems. Importantly, it also attends to changing conditions. So we are managing uh, both for resilient human communities and also for resilient ecosystems. One example of this type of ecosystem-based science is work that I've led in collaboration with a lot of different partners uh, under the rubric, the Maine Coastal Resilience Project. And we've had a number of projects in different parts of the Maine coast, but they've all uh, been focused on these three objectives. First, identifying features that contribute to the resilience of coastal communities and ecosystems to change. Secondly, working with individual coastal communities like Damariscotta and Newcastle and the community of Georgetown and also Bremen, where we're synthesizing data and bringing it together in a way that's useful for decision making at a really local level. And finally, uh, we've had the privilege of working with uh, at least one community, and there's some other projects in preparation, where we're helping communities design commun bridge plans, uh, is what they're called, very similar to comprehensive plans, so that people can begin to plan for the future and proactively managing the types of challenges that I flagged earlier in terms of sea level rise and, and other issues. 
uh, in the communities of Damascata, Newcastle, and Bremen, we have a shellfish resilience project that's actually been ongoing since 2019. That's why nobody's wearing a mask in these pictures. These are all um, from the before times. And in this project, which is funded by the Broadreach Fund, among others, we are working with local communities to provide better ecological information for shellfish management. And as part of that work, we're also gathering uh, local knowledge from harvesters, like the person shown on the upper right, um, as well as uh, boat yard owners and municipal leaders and other folks who have important information on how these uh, coastal ecosystems have changed through time and also really distinctive and important perspectives on what they might look like in the future. So this is an example of a project where we're responding to community interests and need and we're integrating information both on the types of changes that I described earlier um, related to, to the coastal environment and we're, we're bringing in not just scientific knowledge but also local knowledge to help solve problems. This figure just depicts that approach. Uh, it's a lot of bubbles, but, but to, to break it down, if you look on the right hand side, you're looking at uh, the ecological domain. So we're studying clams and we're doing that in a really local way in the Damascata River estuary. But we're thinking about how are those clams and their offspring impacted by changes that might be due to uh, influxes of nutrients or changes in water chemistry that are actually coming from way out uh, in, in the open part of the ocean in the Gulf of Maine. So we're thinking about those linkages between the very local and the larger marine ecosystem. And similarly, on the social side of things, uh, particularly focused on these wild caught shell fisheries in the, the mid coast part of Maine, we're thinking about how individual harvesters are impacted by changes in regulation and changes in price and what sort of um, support and challenges local uh, institutions and regulations create for people who are making a living off of the clam flats. So there's a, a multi-scale nature to our investigation and um, what I think makes it quite different than a lot of work that's been done like this around the world is that we really, we don't start with this bubble diagram. <laughs> we start by listening, listening to the questions that people have and the challenges they're trying to overcome. And then we build these types of figures together in ways that um, hopefully help us uh, gather information and apply it in ways that are, that are meaningful. So uh, one thing that, that I, I wanna drive home is, is that we're in a pretty unusual position here in Maine. We have some of the, literally the world's experts in ecosystem-based science and management, people who are called uh, until the last several months anyway, called all over the world to work on fisheries and forest related questions uh, and take this type of ecosystem-based approach. And fortunately, in, in the main Climate Council process that I wanna spend the last few minutes here on, uh, the state of Maine, uh, we were all able to leverage this expertise that people have in order to address the, the goals of the Maine Climate Council. Robbie, how many more minutes do I have left? Uh, as many as, as you, you really need. We're doing well on time. So, you know, even five or 10 minutes if you need. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, so again, I just wanna briefly introduce the, the goals of the Climate Council for those of you who aren't familiar with it. And then I'll talk a little bit about the types of recommendations that the Coastal and Marine Group in particular um, made to, to the Climate Council. And this is very much an ongoing process. So um, two things, I, again, I want you to take away from this talk. One is there's a lot of reason for hope, both in terms of the science and the action. Secondly, this Climate Council work is not fully baked. So if this is all new to you, now is a great time to start paying attention to what's going on because um, the next months and next couple of years are going to be really important in terms of how this process um, influences our state and our state's future. These are big goals here that were set uh, in motion through uh, legislative action and the governor in 2019, and that led to the launch of the Climate Council in September 2019. 
to respond to these four goals. First, to meet the state's bold emission reduction goals, so to cut our carbon. Secondly, to support resilience and adaptation by Maine people and Maine communities. And third, to do that while growing good paying jobs and deliberately and carefully uh, setting up systems that provide for points of transition to a low carbon economy for people who are going to be particularly impacted by this effort to move to a low carbon economy. So um, people who are living in remote communities, rural communities where we need to drive more to get where we need to go, individuals who are more elderly, who have faced particular challenges in terms of accessing services, particularly if roads are flooding more, more frequently, that uh, addressing those challenges and those vulnerabilities is, is core to the Climate Council process. So I wanna take you through uh, about six strategies here that the Coastal and Marine Working Group came up with. And um, the great news is, is that many of the other working groups, there were six of us all together, six groups, came up with very similar strategies. So hopefully that's making the council's job a little bit easier because they can look across the folks who were thinking about forests and agricultural lands and the people who were thinking about energy and building and the folks who were thinking about emergency management and coastal resilience and those of us thinking about uh, coastal and marine systems and see some really clear patterns. This first strategy focuses on knowing what's going on so that we can do something about it. Uh, we, we articulate a number of measures that could be taken by the state or other partners to track climate impacts and support adaptive de decision making, particularly at the local level by towns as well as by state government in partner with many others. So here are two images of state uh, agency scientists who are out gathering data on our changing salt marshes and our changing fishery stocks. And that type of information is absolutely essential so that we have a sense of how our environment is shifting and what the consequences are likely to be for Maine communities and uh, Maine, the Maine economy going forward. The second strategy set focuses on providing technical assistance and outreach. And this already happens in a lot of different ways through Cooperative Extension and Maine Sea Grant and many other entities across the state. And so we call those out as good examples. And we also uh, make some suggestions, in this case, particular to the coastal and marine uh, do domain, where uh, enhanced technical assistance could be really helpful for Maine families, for Maine businesses, and for Maine communities. So a lot of this emphasis is on um, local scale support so that people get that information on monitoring that they need to make better decisions for their, their businesses and their communities. Strategies three and four are focused on enhancing uh, mitigation and adaptation to climate change impacts by taking care of our natural areas. Here's a salt marsh. And this salt marsh does two, at least two really important things for people. In addition to all the other things it, it just does by, by existing. It is a storage site for carbon. So when carbon is admitted, admitted into the atmosphere, some of it is sucked up by plants. Some of those plants are in salt marshes like this. And depending on the longevity of these habitats and whether they are conserved through time and protected from coastal storms, they can be a really important sink for carbon. And so that's uh, a really active area of interest scientifically. It's also a really important mitigation strategy for climate change impacts. Uh, this salt marsh also is important in terms of adaptation to climate change impacts. Salt marshes in particular locations can be very important in terms of buffering coastal human communities from storm impacts and also soaking up um, materials that otherwise would be flowing into uh, estuaries and potentially damaging uh, other ecosystems. So salt marshes and other coastal habitats uh, provide a really important role and that's why two strategies were devoted to them. Strategy five focuses on Maine's fisheries and aquaculture industries. And uh, one thing that came out really early from our, our work as, as a group uh, was how adaptive 
fishermen and fisheries managers are already. Uh, we have incredibly dynamic marine systems off of our coast. And so if you are making a living out on the water, or if you are making your living supporting those who are making a living out on the water as a resource manager, then you're thinking about uh, dynamic ecosystems all the time and what that means for, for, for local economies and communities. So we have a lot of good experience in our state for how to manage for resilient fisheries and aquaculture. And that led um, to the recommendations in this area. Finally, there, there was a call out for climate ready working waterfronts. So um, including but not limiting ourselves to thinking about fisheries and aquaculture businesses, we also need to be sure uh, that the infrastructure continues to be in place to support boat building operations, um, other marine trades initiatives, and that means uh, up, updating and enhancing many of the technical assistance and grants uh, and planning programs that are available to communities to uh, take good care of their working waterfronts. So that brings me to the end of the coastal and marine strategies. As I said before, this is very much an ongoing process and you can learn more about it and learn more about uh, Maine's responses to climate change impacts at this URL. And with that, I'll leave you uh, a, a picture of the Darling Center shoreline, uh, and I'd be happy to take questions and can't wait to hear what the speakers have to say. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Heather. That, that was really, really terrific. Um, and we're going to get to our panel in a second, but before we, we keep going, I just want to remind folks that I'm sure that you have lots and lots of questions, so feel free to post those in the, uh, the, the group chat to, to the right, right there, and I'm going to try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, so, so first, we do have this great panel. So I just want to start out, uh, as, I, as I've done with other panels, with just having each of our panelists just introduce yourselves, telling me a little bit about uh, their, their own roles in kind of what their organization's working on, and particularly around this area. So I, I'm going to start with, uh, with, with Jeff. Uh, go, go ahead, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your work. Thanks, Robbie, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Jeffrey Smith. I'm the Marine Program Director for the Nature Conservancy in Maine. <clears throat> um, I have over 25 years of experience in the conservation field, uh, including the last 15 years with TNC. Um, and in addition to my work at the Nature Conservancy, I'm a member of Maine's uh, Marine Resources Advisory Council. I'm a member of the New England Fisheries Management Council's Ground Fish Advisory Panel. And I'm also a board member for the Maine Coast Community Groundfish Sector. Sector, excuse me. Um, at TNC, I'm responsible for leading all aspects of our ocean conservation work. Uh, this includes designing and implementing marine conservation strategies, uh, working with colleagues to influence policy at the state, local, and national level, and working collaboratively with fishermen and other ocean-dependent businesses to try to solve. Uh, the many complex problems facing the Gulf of Maine today that uh, Heather just talked to us about. Uh, I also have the pleasure of working with dedicated marine conservationists from uh, New Hampshire and Massachusetts and across New England to try to ensure that our work is uh, coordinated, that it's effective, and that it has the maximum impact across the Gulf of Maine. Uh, I'd say even more importantly, I also have the privilege of working every day with uh, dedicated fishermen and community members to try to adjust these challenges facing the Gulf of Maine, including uh, changes in productivity and shifts in species distribution caused by climate change, uh, depleted fish populations, and habitat loss and degradation. And I just, I'm really impressed how much these folks realize that we can't have successful fishing businesses or thriving coastal communities without a healthy and resilient marine ecosystem here in the Gulf of Maine. Um, it, I'll just say it's really an honor to work with them every day. Um, I'll stop there and just say thanks for giving me uh, the opportunity to be part of this conversation today. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Gabby Hillier with the Maine Shellfish Learning Network. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Gabby Hillier. I'm the project coordinator for the Maine Shellfish Learning Network, um, which is an organization that's focused on supporting a lot of the efforts that Heather already described, particularly with the Maine Shellfish Restoration and Resilience Fund projects. 
I'm also a PhD student at the University of Maine Orono um, in the National Research Traineeship Program. So a lot of my work spans the gambit between serving as a scientist and as an advisor, as well as a connection between different communities, the projects that they work with, and um, a number of information blocks that happen between governmental institutions and communities. I'd echo Jeff's comments that I work closely with a number of dedicated harvesters, fishermen, and stakeholders who are always very adamant about being aware around the problems that they're facing and very active in trying to respond to those issues. And I would also echo that while the way that Heather presented a lot of the issues with this current of hope, I find hope a lot in the work that I do around how many different ways um, Mainers have been able to find new techniques to respond to the challenges that we face, particularly in our coastal ecosystems. And thank you also for the opportunity to be part of this conversation. Great, thank you, Gabby. Um, and now uh, Ben Martens with the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association. Hi, uh, thank you guys. Uh, this is a pleasure to be here with everybody today and Heather, fantastic job on the presentation. So I'm, I'm Ben Martens. I'm the executive director of the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association. We work with community-based fishermen up and down the coast of Maine who work in a variety of fisheries from ground fish to lobsters to scallops to herring. And essentially we work with fishermen who believe really strongly in the idea of stewardship, in the idea of conservation, and uh, really that everything we are doing today should be building a brighter future for the next generation of fishermen throughout our fishing communities. Uh, so our fishermen are the ones who are advocating for different types of policies and projects um, that support the work that uh, you know, our other colleagues have, have kind of touched on when they're talking about conservation uh, projects. Um, but we, we have fantastic fishermen that really are trying to create the change um, and drive the change from their perspectives on the water um, in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, so we do a lot of different projects as an organization. A lot of it's based on policy um, and research. Uh, we've done a, a bunch of work around working waterfront preservation as well, but I'm, I'm really excited to dig into the conversation today and, and touch on some of the questions I'm seeing popping up already about what's happening in our marine resources and how that, that impacts what's ultimately ending up on our dinner plates, which is a, a big driver to a, a lot of this conversation is uh, the seafood that we're catching and then and hopefully eating in Maine. So thanks. Great, Th thank you, Ben. And, and last but not least, uh, Rebecca with the Maine Mathematics and Science Alliance. Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca Clark Uchenna and I'm really excited to be a part of this great panel. Um, there is a lot of doom and gloom out there right now, um, but I think our conversations um, will leave you feeling hopeful at the end. Um, so I work for the Maine Math and Science Alliance. I'm one of the STEM education um, research specialists. Um, and MMSA uh, works in K-12 um, education systems. So in school and out of school, after school programs. And STEM stands for Science, Techno Technology, Engineering, and Math. So that is our focus, um, all things STEM. Um, I wear a couple of different hats in the organization. Um, I am one of the co-fair directors for the Maine State Science Fair, which happens um, every spring. So be on the lookout for Maine State Science Fair promos. Um, and I am also a program coordinator for the citizen science program called Weather Blur. And Weather Blur, is a elementary through middle school program um, and it is open um, to schools here in Maine and we've also partnered with schools in Alabama and Mississippi uh, looking at their local ecosystems, very place-based education, students create their own investigations um, around observations that they've made in their backyards or in their schoolyards um, and then they create these community action projects. Um, so it's been really exciting to be a part of that program. We've had students investigate green crabs, uh, microplastics, sea level rise, um, king tide flooding, um, really focused on changing climates um, and observations that they're making on a daily basis. 
Great. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I appreciate it. And then thank you to all of our panelists again and to Heather. Um, we're already getting some great questions and feel free to write those in in the group chat. But I, I want to start with, with just kind of an, an overview question. Um, this might be at you, Heather, first, but I'd love to, to get everybody else in this. Is just, Heather, you talk so much about the the, the changes and kind of the, 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 the bridges that we're already seeing, the adaptation. And I guess I'm just wondering how just kind of a, a status update of like where we actually sit, where our commu coastal communities are right now in terms of how much they know about climate change, how much they're still learning and, and how much they've already adapted. So can you just kind of do, do we do we know kind of where, where we stand right now with that? That's a, a very good question um, that I give a partial answer to that. I, I think it's a little bit hard to know if we are not explicitly uh, asking people directly, where, where do you stand? So organizations like the Maine Municipal Association, as well um, as some of the sustainability scientists associated with the Mitchell Center at UMaine, um, they, they have asked questions like that of communities in particular places, but I don't know, perhaps another panel member does, of any um, survey that's been statewide. Uh, so there's been more there's been more targeted surveys for sure in particular communities or parts of the coast, but statewide. My own anecdotal impression from working statewide and in other parts of the world on these issues um, is is uh, that we are in a really great place in some cases with some of these challenges, and that we have a real long ways to go with others. And I think that's part of the reason why. Um, why so many of us dug in uh, when, the, when, when the governor's office asked us to engage on the Climate Council work is because we see innovations and signs of hope, but we also see that there's a long ways to go on, on pieces of these issues. Yeah, and anybody else wanna to add to that? Jeff, I see your hand. Oh, Jeff, you're still muted. Apologies for that. Hopefully that'll be the last time I do that. Um, <laughs> I, I think here at the at TNC, we're, we're certainly seeing a, uh, a growing interest in this in this area of what's happening with coastal, coastal communities as a result of climate change. Uh, we, we track the work of the Climate Council pretty closely. We had staffers on there, but um, one of the things that Conservancy has done over the last couple of years is try to develop some tools to help coastal communities plan for climate change to help them identify vulnerable areas in their communities, whether they be road crossings or bridges, and how it is that those communities are gonna be able to respond and adapt so that as the water rises and things change, these communities are ahead of the game and they have some tools available to them to help plan. And um, it's not something that I work on directly, but I know from our staff at TNC that do work on it, it seems that there is growing interest from communities up and down the coast to try to use these tools to help them uh, plan for climate change. And I think just that level of interest in these tools um, is indicative that more and more communities are recognizing what's going on in the Gulf of Maine and recognizing the need to plan better um, so their communities can adapt and, uh, and be safe in the face of climate change. Great, and, and Ben, I see your hand as well. Yeah, so I, you know, when we talk about communities, there's lots of different communities and how you might define them. And so in terms of like the fishing community at large, as we're thinking about boats out on the water or, or people digging in the, the mud flats, um, fishermen have been on the front line of seeing change coming, right? Their fish stocks are heavily dependent on temperature. And so fishermen for years have been saying things are changing, things look different, um, this is weird. And now we're at that stage where we've done the conversion from things look weird to how do we start to adapt or hopefully mitigate and stop some of the some of the changes happening and and that's really where um, the work that Heather's doing in the Climate Council could be really valuable um, and and hopefully um, you know we can start reducing climate impacts because we we need to to kind of stem the tide we can't just mitigate away the problem we can't just um, adapt away the problem and uh, and hopefully that's that's part of the equation that will be coming out of the climate. Um, process is, you know, we want to reduce those, uh, those types of, of emissions along our coats. And we think the fishing community can be a real important part of that equation um, in both, you know, seafood as a good source of, of food that is carbon friendly, but also working waterfront and, and other types of, um, you know, efforts along the coast that can really be helpful along the way.
Yeah, Ben, I actually, this is somewhat related to, to another question that, that I had for you as I was thinking through this, which was just, obviously, there have been so many other factors that have been affecting Maine fishermen, you know, over the past, you know, six, six months with, with COVID and everything like that. How does a community like the, the fishing community in, in Maine, how, how do you balance both just dealing with those like short term impacts of like making sure fishermen survive through this, while also focusing and advocating for those longer term issues as well? Hi, so that is, uh, that's the most enjoyable part of my job is trying to like walk that balance beam of there are things that we need to fix right now. Um, and there are businesses that are in jeopardy. There are families that are in jeopardy because of things that are happening currently. Um, but we still need to be building towards that brighter future um, and, and thinking about those, those things. And so it, it takes, um, so our organization doesn't work with every fisherman up and down the coast, right? Like we work with a lot of fishermen who are able to take that step back and think about stewardship as a concept in terms of how we manage our fisheries and how we manage our future. And um, I think that that's just, it's an important concept that we have to start talking about at a younger age. Um, and we have to start like working through a lot of our language and discussion is it doesn't matter. Like we, we need to make sure that we are focused on fixing the big climate problem. But if we have people that are having to make a choice about being able to pay their mortgage today, or worrying about what the climate future looks like in 50 years. Like we have to address both those problems at the same time. And um, it takes money and investment and caring people along the way to make that happen. And so we, we struggle there, but that's also the most, that's where the innovation and opportunity lies in where those things rub together. How do we get so that people are healthier in their current state of living, but also we're building towards that brighter future. And um, we have a lot of great people in Maine who are, who are striving to make that happen. Right. Yeah, and, and Gabby, uh, feel free to add on to that. Sorry, I lost my mouse there for a bit. Um, yeah, no, I think I think echoing kind of what Ben said, um, a lot of my work is very community based, and I work primarily with with uh, soft shell clamming communities across Maine. Um, and what we've been seeing play out at the MSLN is that we see individual communities are really focused on those short-term solutions, particularly with COVID, that the responses were really on the ground on a localized level. Um, and then we kind of saw this second wave of larger statewide response to the disruption that COVID-19 had caused. Um, and I think that that's where we see a lot of the connection to climate change and adaptation is that a lot of the individual communities are still focused on short-term work but they're starting to draw connections to how those short-term problems are connected to longer-term trends. And so at least at the state level, we're starting to see those conversations happen um, to address those concerns in a more holistic and representative way. Yeah. And, and Jeff, I see your, your hand is raised as well. Yeah, I wanna give others on the panel an opportunity to talk as well, but if yeah. there is a moment, I just wanted to add something to what Ben had said, but if others wanna speak first, please do. Sure. Well, I just wanted to ask, uh, Re Rebecca, with, with Ben kind of talking about needing to get to people at a younger age, I mean, I thought that that was, that's almost exactly what, what you do. Can you talk about, like, how, how, how do we do that? Sure. Yeah, so a lot of students that I work with are from fishing families. Um, we work with island and coastal schools. So these students are not only making observations in their backyards and at their schools, but they're also living uh, kind of the stresses that their parents are living through. Um, and at a really young age, they're able to understand um, these changes and the pressures that fishermen are seeing. Um, I think a lot of times people don't really acknowledge uh, the power of student voices in these decision policy making uh, plans in this world that we now live in. Um, but these students understand the importance of um, ecosystem health, how humans interact with their ecosystems, and how um, these really complicated interactions um, affect our everyday lives. So don't underestimate students. <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca. And I'll, I'll turn, turn to Jeff again. Thanks, Robbie. I appreciate it. Uh, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on uh, the, the question regarding the balance between uh, short-term and long-term impacts and goals. And um, <clears throat> I've seen a couple of questions pop up on the screen about ground fish mm -hmm. uh, in the, uh, along the coast of Maine. And 
one of the things that Ben and I have been working on for the past uh, three years now, Ben, I think, um, is, a, is a regulatory amendment that the New England Fisheries Management Council um, just approved last week to try to improve monitoring in our ground fish fishery so we can get better information for our science and our management. Um, one of the keys to this is trying to bring in fishermen's observations from the water to inform our stock assessments and our management. And I was really impressed by the number of fishermen that participated in that process and were really, you know, struggling to, to find the balance between potential short-term economic impacts of, of monitoring or changes in the fishery from the monitoring, but also realizing that if we're going to rebuild ground fish populations in the Gulf of Maine, we need to have better monitoring, we need to have better science, we need to have better data. And I think I was just really impressed by the number of fishermen that took the longer term view on that, realizing that, you know, to have a healthy business, we got to have healthy fish populations. And they were able to um, support that work that the council did last week. And, you know, it was interesting to me that one of the loudest voices supporting that work was probably one of the youngest ground fish fishermen that I know along the coast of Maine. Um, I worked with his dad a lot and he just started ground fishing a couple of years ago and he really stepped up because he realizes his future uh, depends on healthier fish populations. So I think fishermen are able to uh, strike that balance between short-term economic interests and their long-term goals for the fishery and it's a pleasure to work with them on it. Great. Um, ben, is there anything else you wanted to add to that, that work with ground fish? Sure. Uh, so to start, I guess um, not everybody on the, the call or Zoom is probably aware of what a ground fish is because that's a weird term. Um, but so ground fish are species like cod and haddock and flounder and halibut. And so all of these species that are caught on the bottom of the ocean, ground, um, are grouped together in a management uh, strategy. And so we, we collectively refer to them as ground fish, but those are things like cod and haddock and flounder that are caught um, by, by a fisherman who has a certain type of permit that allows them to do so. And so, um, yeah, I would just echo, you know, echo everything that Jeff said and then add on top of it that we're super lucky in Maine, right? So like we're, there's a robust process, um, public outreach, public comment in all these different types of regulatory uh, discussions, whether it's scallops or groundfish or herring. And um, Maine is, is usually one of the, some of the loudest voices from the fishing community um, focused on stewardship and conservation. And we are lucky. I've worked with fishermen uh, all around the country and, and we just have a very unique group of fishermen in Maine when it comes to their ability to straddle that line um, and try and build towards that better future. Great. Um, so I'm going to try to turn to, because I, I know where we're already short, short on time. And so I want to get to some of the more of these, uh, these questions from our, uh, our listeners and viewers. Um, so one of them is just kind of a, a big overview question of th that and any of you really could take, but can you discuss the reasons why the Gulf of Maine is warming so rapidly compared to other areas of the world's oceans? That's a, a, a multi-hour oceanographic <laughs> lecture. Uh, David Townsend wrote a great book that explains it very well, among others. Uh, but I think there's a couple key reasons uh, as a, to keep in mind. One is that it's an inland sea, essentially. So um, there's a very shallow uh, bank, the George's Bank, and, and other features at, at the mouth of the Gulf of Maine. And so once water gets pushed in to the Gulf of Maine, it actually, it spends more time there um, in an area that, that wasn't so uh, constricted in terms of just its topography. So there's sort of a bathymetric reason why uh, there's warming. There's also larger currents uh, coming particularly from the Arctic, from the poles that are influencing the relative movement of fresher seawater and saltier seawater. And that uh, process that's going on in our Arctic is also influencing dynamics in the Gulf of Maine. So there's some elements that are sort of, they're local. <laughs> and then there's other elements that are even bigger than the Gulf of Maine that are influencing what we're seeing in terms of um, 
the, the rate of warming. I, I have to say for the sake of, of scientific precision that um, exactly how much the Gulf of Maine is warming relative to other parts of the world ocean is a hotly debated topic among specialists in that area, which I am not one of, uh, but suffice it to say it is among the most quickly warming uh, places. And we've seen the results of that. We've seen species that used to be considered warmer water, or at least mid-Atlantic species, moving north into Maine waters. And some of that has been of benefit and some of it has caused challenges. Anyone want to just jump in on that? I see Jeff, your hand. Yeah, just very quickly to um, add on what Heather said. Um, my understanding, and uh, I like her, you have to be careful here, but uh, Heather talked about the the Arctic water coming down, I believe it's the Labrador current coming down from the north, and then we have the Gulf Stream coming up from the south, which is carrying a lot of much warmer water. And I believe what's happening is the global oceans are changing, is the place where the Labrador current meets the Gulf Stream and the warm water meets the cold water is shifting a little bit. And we're getting more of the Gulf Stream water pushed into the channel that Heather mentioned and coming into the Gulf of Maine in our enclosed sea here. So it is, as I understand it, it is a sort of global oceans phenomenon where slight changes where those two big masses of water have changed and we're getting more water in than we, more warm water in than we used to. Um, and that's one of the reasons that contribute to it, if I understand it correctly. And anybody else wanna jump in on anything related on that one? Okay, great. Um, so now I wanna move into to another question. Uh, we see a question from Ed about river herring. He's asking, would more river herring nurtured and coming out of our rivers help increase the number of fish populations in the Gulf of Maine and what's the best way to support these fish? So whoever wants to jump on that one. Oh, ben, take it away. Sure. Uh, yes, uh, one of the major indicators when it comes to fish populations is making sure there's enough forage in the ocean for them. Uh, and historically, uh, herring, so Atlantic herring, offshore herring, is the primary productivity when it comes to ground fish and tuna and sharks. Uh, and that population has declined significantly over the past 10 years. Uh, and so if we can do other types of work to bring back the more inshore species, uh, the hope is that we'll kind of protect and rebuild those you know, those stocks and then in turn, those higher up the food chain will have enough to eat. Um, that being said, the ecosystem is very different out there now than when those dams went up. Uh, and so we don't know what the inshore grounds are like any longer. There's a lot more lobster traps uh, out there. There's a lot more bait um, to put in those lobster traps. So, you know, typically cod and haddock, uh, they would chase the river herring inshore. And uh, there's, there's some concern that because because of how we have changed the ecosystem, that that might not always happen any longer. Uh, but that being said, we should be returning those, you know, river herring are great, great uh, primary productivity uh, along our, our coast. And we should really be you know, rebuilding those um, in the hopes that they start to bring some stability to the offshore ecosystem at the same time. And then we also see what's the best way to support these fish as well? Is there, you know, something that communities or people should be doing? Yeah, so the real simple answer is that like the dams are dams and other things that are impeding the way of river herring, those are mostly municipal uh, issues. And so that's showing up to your town meetings, that's getting your towns and others within communities involved in fixing those dams. It's like, and it's not always big dams. Sometimes it can be like a collapsed culvert that's standing in the way. And so, um, there are very simple things that locals can do by getting involved in their towns and communities to have a voice. Yeah, we really heard that last week. Laura Rose Day was, was with us on our, you know, and she was talking all about that and, you know, what you can do locally about, about that issue. So, um, yeah, but I see, I see Jeff uh, raising his hand as well, if you want to jump in. Again, I want to give others the opportunity yeah. to talk, but I did have something to say. So I will pause and if no one else does, I will say something. Okay, anyone else want to jump in? We'll let, we'll let Jeff go and then I'll turn to others. Thanks, Robbie. I did, yeah. I'll be quick. Um, you know, Ben mentioned earlier that we're, we're lucky to live in Maine. I think this issue around um, restoration of sea run fish, uh, alewives and shad, et cetera, is something that the state of Maine has embraced. Um, everything from large scale river restoration projects like the Penobscot River uh, restoration project to much smaller ones. And I think that um, Ben really hit on it very well that 
there are big dams that are in the way, but there also are a lot of culverts and uh, stream crossings that we need to address. Um, the Conservancy has helped, again, uh, local communities with some tools to help them look at barriers um, to fish passage. Uh, and it's really, I think, from our perspective, it's, it's a win-win on some of those smaller culverts because, um, you know, when those culverts are undersized, the fish can't migrate up them, which is a problem for the fish. But it also can, um, you know, causes flooding of roads and causes real problems for those communities when those undersized culverts fail or back up water. So the, the river connectivity work is, I think, very important for both the, the fish that need to get up and down the river, but the communities that um, have these undersized culverts. And um, we're, we're really happy to be able to provide those communities with some tools to help them look at um, where their culverts might be undersized, how they might be able uh, to replace those and to help them find funding to do it. Because it's, uh, you know, there's not a lot of them, but it feels like one of the proverbial win-wins for, for both communities and fisheries uh, on river restoration work. Right. Um a question somewhat unrelated, but I did, I did want to get in there, was um, just about how to get these kind of messages out in the different ways that, that, that you know, you all and others are, are doing this. Um, particularly, I was interested in, in asking Gabby about, I, I was noticing in the work that the Maine Shellfish Learning Network is doing, that they have experts in both like communications and journalism kind of working on some of this to get the message out there. I guess Gabby, can you, we'll start with you. Can you kind of talk a little bit about that, that work and the, I guess the importance of, of getting that out and not just kind of letting, I guess, science be, be science and insulated from, you know, publicity and all those different things. Yeah, um, I can definitely speak more to that. Similar to Heather's response about the warming of the Gulf of Maine, that could easily be its own <laughs> hour to hour conversation. Um, but uh, my work represents kind of a team collaborative effort. So I work very closely with Dr. Brady McGreevy and Dr. Anthony Sutton, um, both of whom bring great perspectives about communication and science communication in particular. Um, we have always striven to try and identify ways to communicate information as well as make information generally more accessible to those who are interested. Um, and that kind of comes into a twofold effort. One, going to communities very often, maintaining close relationships with leaders in those communities and partners in those communities, and also making ourselves much more open to answer questions and be available for any type of interest. Um, and in that sense, a lot of the work that um, Dr. Sutton is doing with the Maine Indian Tribal Commission, um, as well as what Bridie has been able to do with the Broad Reach Fund on the resilience grants, um, I think highlights our commitment to communication and highlights our commitment to trying to respond to community needs. Great. Anyone else want to jump in on, you know, if, if that, you know, is similar to, to other work that you all are doing? Wait, anyone? Oh, Rebecca. I'll jump in real quick. Um, I think knowing your audience and who you are communicating to um, helps with your messaging. So one group may be really passionate about blue economies and kind of the workforce aspect of um, the oceans. Others might be more focused on conservation efforts. So really understanding your audiences when you're messaging. Um, I will also say that I've been working a lot on um, helping our students communicate data and data literacy. How do you interpret graphs? Um, Heather, you showed a really very colorful graph um, in your presentation, lots of lines. Um, and a lot of people get super overwhelmed looking at graphs and numbers and charts. Um, so helping people kind of break down those barriers when in trying to interpret data, I think is super important right now. Great. Great. I want to get, we're, we're already running a long time, so I want to get to just a couple more questions. Um, one more from, it's from Nathaniel. He's asking, is there any indication of a return of the soft shell clam population? How are we managing the green crab invasion and its impact on mussels as well? So whoever wants to take that one. I, I can give it a first yeah. try. I'm sure there's others too. Uh, so, so I'm not aware of what came out of this year's sampling, but Dr. Brian Beal at the Down East Institute, which serves as the Marine Field Station for University of Maine at Machias, did a coastwide analysis of recruitment or settlement of new baby clams. Um, 
And so that type of approach gives us information on that next generation of clams. Um, we did a little bit of that in the Damariscata uh, last year, and it, it was, I guess I would say bleak. <laughs> it, our pilot trial, very, very small scale, was bleak. There weren't a lot of baby clams to be found. Um, so that's one important indication, and we need to keep doing that on appropriate scales that can help um, inform management. On the green crab front, it's a, I'd say a little bit more hopeful um, work by Manomet scientist Marissa Mahanan um, shows that it's possible to help turn green crabs into a tasty seafood product. So she's working with a lot of other people statewide on um, making green crabs uh, a, a value added product that people want to eat. And so that's one way we might be able to um, solve the green crab problem is eat our way out of it. Great. Anyone else want to jump in and, and add to it? Add to that? No? Great. Um, so I'm going to get to one more kind of slight kind of seafood question a little bit, but about seaweed particularly. We have a question about kind of the, the increased harvesting that we're seeing of seaweed. What effect is that having on the, the ecosystem right now? Do you want to take that as well, Heather, or you want somebody else to take it? I guess I would just say that I think it's a topic of active research and certainly a lot of people are very interested from a conservation, but also an economic development standpoint. Um, what is a sustainable level of harvest? To my knowledge, um, there's not state level consensus on that yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any, anyone else want to, oh, Gabby? Yeah, I mean, I think that's similar to uh, just echoing Heather's comments, I think the way that we understand um, population size, particularly in shellfish and in seaweed, is we have to move away from just using landings data or how much is brought into market, I guess, which is what the issue is with shellfish right now. Um, with seaweed, I would also say that there's different ways to harvest and create space, um, which they're still working on, I think, on a lot of different um, industrial enterprises. Great, great. Oh, and Ben, hop in. Yeah, just for those who might not be aware, so there was a lawsuit uh, that took place because there's uh, was harvesting of seaweed taking place in the intertidal that uh, prompted local landowners to raise concerns about that taking place, um, both who owned the intertidal, who was allowed to get access, et cetera. And, um, and so there's a lot of big questions about what that means and long-term impacts that the, um, there was a judge's ruling that basically decided that seaweed is part of the land and therefore the landowner controls it. Whereas clams and mussels and other things that are in the intertidal are actually public domain. And so shellfish harvest can go down there and, and use and work in the intertidal. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done when it comes to not just understanding the important ecosystem role that uh, seaweed plays, and it is very, very important, but there are also economic questions and, you know, access questions. And one of the things that we run into when we start talking about the working waterfront, how we define the working waterfront and how we define our working waters is um, as we start to see our coasts develop, as we start to see new residents moving in who might not be as familiar with um, a way of life in Maine that is active and working and sometimes loud and sometimes stinky is um, we have these clashes take place. And so to get back to the, you know, one of the other questions about communications, um, you know, there are oftentimes breakdowns in communication around the working waterfront. And uh, we've gotten involved in a bunch of different fights and battles throughout our coast just because people don't talk anymore. And that is one of the places that I would really heavily encourage everybody who's participating in this and um, sharing is like, we are one big community along this coast and the working waterfront is an opportunity. And whether that's the mud flats or the rocks or the docks and wharves, uh, we need to have a little bit better of a shared understanding of what it takes to maintain and protect and invest in those places for the long-term stability of the ecosystem and the economy. Um, and a way of life, which is, you know, always, always right on the edge of, of disappearing if we don't do our own stewardship of maintaining our, our working waterfronts and the working people of Maine. Yeah, yeah. Talk to each other. It's a good, it's a good message. Um, I wanted to, uh, I, I imagine I'm probably going to be told to wrap this up quickly. So I wanted to get to just a couple more questions that, um, that I really wanted to ask about 
I wanted kind of each of you to, to, to tell me a little bit, if you, if you could, um, obviously we're talking about resilience in coastal communities, different coastal communities. Are there certain projects or towns or places that we should kind of be watching for what they're doing that might kind of serve as like, like a bellwether going forward, if that makes sense? Are, are there places that stand out that we should be paying attention to? Anybody wants to take it? Sure. Well, I want to give a shout out for Stonington and, and the work that they've done in recent years and in collaboration with many partners, including the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. Um, there, there's uh, there are a port of regional significance. And so there's many people who fish out of Stonington, which uh, in the last couple of years has, the, has had the highest um, volume of landings of lobster anywhere on the coast. I think I got that right, but Ben or Jeff will correct me if I didn't quite get it right. Um, they're a really important place and yet, and they're providing services regionally. So not everyone who benefits from those services is within those town boundaries and is paying taxes um, to support those services. So thinking about how to continue to be that port of regional significance, also managing rising sea levels and what that means for critical infrastructure like roads on and off the island, all those things are really complicated. And I've seen from a bit of a distance as part of uh, the work I've been doing in collaboration with folks at MCCF and elsewhere that Stonington's really taking the lead in this regard. And I think they'll be important to watch. Great. Um, other places? I think, Jeff, I see your hand up. Yeah, just quickly, um, not to highlight this over other places, but yes, for one. So there's been some very interesting things going on in Georgetown um, right now over the past couple of years. I know they've done a comprehensive land use plan. They've incorporated um, climate change and adaptation to climate change in that uh, in that comprehensive plan. So I think they are they are looking to the future and planning. I know they've also done a lot of work in that community to try to um, help foster a uh, successful and sustainable oyster uh, aquaculture businesses there. They're, they've you know invested money and created micro lending um, opportunities so that people trying to get in the business have an opportunity to do it, but to also do it sustainably and responsibly. So I just I know there's some. Uh, I'm aware of some very interesting things going on in Georgetown. That certainly doesn't cover all of it, but if folks are interested, it might be a good place to look. Interesting. Any others that you all want to mention? Sure. Gabby? Yeah, uh, one of the towns I work with very closely, Waldeboro, has been able to put together, they call it the Madomic Task Force, which was this collaborative project to try and fix different water quality issues that were happening in the estuary and impacting shellfish. I think a lot of the work done in that collaborative space had, should be highlighted um, to the extent possible just because it serves as a great adaptation to a lot of the different issues that we're talking about right now. Great. Thanks, Gabby. And anything else, Rebecca or Ben? No. If not, then um, I have been told to wrap it up. So I think that is what we are going to do. I'd like to thank you all, all of our panelists so much, and especially Heather for, for your presentation. Uh, thank you all. I'd also like to thank our sponsors today, uh, the Nature Conservancy in Maine, the Maine Education Association, the Maine Mathematics and Science Alliance, and then of course our, mem our members who make all of our presentations with Maine Public and Maine Public Television possible. Um, and then I just want to let everybody know that all three of these lectures will be online. They're at mainpublic.org. Um, they're on our on our website, and uh, they are you know a highly worthwhile view. I've gotten to sit on these panels. We've had so many great people. So uh, please watch them if you can, and feel free to to share them out once again at mainpublic.org. Uh, thank you to all of our viewers for spending time, our panelists again for uh, for stopping by today, and uh, please tune in to Age of Nature on PBS next week. Thank Thank you all so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you.